So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Newer Diversity at School, Collaboration Strategies for Elementary School Families. We're very excited to have Kristen Hanner back with us today. Kristen is the Fairfax County Public Schools Neurodiversity Specialist. And so welcome, everyone. And Kristen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mary Beth, and thank you to your whole team um, for sponsoring this, for partnering with me in this work, and for having this webinar series. If anyone was not able to attend the first part of it, um, we have the link available for you. And I'm also going to be doing a bit of a review um, in the beginning that you'll see to ground us all in a common understanding and language around neurodiversity so that we can build to our topic uh, this morning on collaboration strategies for elementary school families. You will be uh, receiving a session guide um, as soon as, or pretty soon after this session this morning. And with this, you'll have working definitions of the terminology that we're gonna be using this morning, as well as seeing some visuals of those terminologies some mindset tools and some other um, just tools and resources that you can use uh, applying as soon as you leave this webinar. And so that will be sent out to you. And I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'm Kristen Hainer. I was a special education teacher and general education teacher for almost 10 years in Fairfax County Public Schools, um, a 504 coordinator, special education resource teacher in the Office of School Support. And I started this position as a neurodiversity specialist in May. So in terms of just some background information on my education, um, I have some degrees in biology, special education, educational leadership. And I'm now working on my PhD with one of the focuses being neurodiversity in public education systems. The majority of the research for any of those of you who are um, engaged in this work, whether through personal uh, connections or just an interest, you may have found that there's very little research or resources on neurodiversity in public school systems. The majority of the research and literature and resources exist in higher education or in the workforce. So I'm really excited to be working both professionally and academically to fill this very critical need. And I wanna start us off this morning by framing us in two areas. The so number one, I am a neurodiversity expert and I am not an expert in all things neurodiversity. Um, so as many of you already know, or many of you will learn in our time together this morning that it is an incredibly vast field and it is ever evolving um, as we learn more and more of, and have new terminology and language to use to talk about these different ways of operating. So on one hand, that's incredibly exciting um, as we're learning more. And on the other hand, it also includes many perspectives as we continue to learn more and break boundaries. And I will be um, providing you this morning with some of those different perspectives so that you have an understanding of what is currently taking place in the field. And I want to position myself as a learner with you and a partner with FCPS and our families. Um, like I've said multiple times already, there's likely a lot of expertise in this room. And I want to, in, I want to honor and encourage you to participate um, in the chat as um, as you feel comfortable and see fit. And so I'm constantly learning, not only from the research and literature and articles and podcasts and other platforms, but most importantly, I'm learning from the lived experiences of our students and our staff and our community members. Um, so while I am unable, being the only person in this position, while I'm unable to individually support cases, um, for anyone that's interested, I am always willing and looking for ways to listen and amplify your experiences here in Fairfax County Public Schools so that we can see transformational change. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
just to give you a little more context with this position, the neurodiversity specialist is on the equity and cultural responsiveness team in the Office of Professional Learning and Equity. And this is a brand new position to Fairfax County Public Schools. So currently the role is cultivating understanding and radically inclusive mindsets and practices that honor the diversity in all educational spaces, as well as having a focus on neurodivergent individuals, whether that are our students or our staff, our parents, our community members in, in all different settings to facilitate and engage others in critically reflecting on strength-based mindsets and therefore the language and communication um, that is used between neurotypical and neurodivergent communities to create a sense of belonging and to support neurodiversity affirming practices in our all of our educational spaces while also focusing on our students receiving special education services and specialized instruction. So I'm doing this through collaborating and partnering with central offices, schools, community spaces, and supporting policy work. And um, I appreciate all of the questions that were entered um, with your registration uh, ahead of our time together this morning that I was able to read and review and dig into. And many of the questions were wondering what neurodiversity training is being provided and what um, resources are available for both adults and students. And that is, those are fantastic questions. And my best answer right now is that I'm working on it. And <laughs> I'm doing so through building capacities and collaborating with teams, providing professional development that address mindsets, language use and um, approaches. I have created a neurodiversity project team. There's about 30 members. We just had our kickoff and I'm hoping to partner with those individuals as well um, to create these resources and support this work. And ultimately, my goal is that these learning opportunities and conversations, just like this webinar today, serve as a bread starter. And stick with me on this analogy because I could not think of um, like a virus is really not an appropriate analogy for many reasons. So I was trying to think of how to capture this. Um, so if any of you have ever made bread or you've received a bread starter, bread starters are like sponges. You have to feed that water and that flour with more water and flour in order for them to grow. And you can share that starter or you can break bread, bake bread and break bread too to share with others. So similarly, we have to feed these neurodiversity practices and conversations with new learning and voices and experiences to grow in our understanding so that we can then share these mindsets and approaches with others, just like a starter or some bread, um, so that all can share in the benefit of this. So how can we take what we're learning and all of these conversations, webinars, experiences, and share them so that they can therefore then share and the sharing continues. Um, we have a very large district. However, I have no doubt that we can do this. Our two outcomes for our time together this morning, I'm gonna give you a minute to read over them and then I'm going to elaborate. So when we leave here, by the time we leave here this morning, um, to cultivate an understanding and appreciation for what is neurodiversity and how can we use it to enhance um, our current relationships and have higher um, opportunities for engagement, as well as considering some communication strategies and tools that you can use to advocate for your student um, in efforts to also create positive school partnerships. Um, so I'm going to be sharing some of the academic literature and the some of lived experiences from individuals as qualitative data, and I'm going to do my best to incorporate as many of those requests as I received ahead of time um, in alignment with this topic. So this is not a quick or overnight fix, but like I said, 
I have hope that we are going to, the fact that everyone has showed up this morning, that we can do this together. Um, and so you also may have noticed that this webinar is focused on ways in which families can best partner with schools to support the neurodiversity of their student or any student. And you may have thought to yourself, but aren't there at least two groups in a partnership? What about, what about the schools? Um, and so many families here have a range of experiences in partnering and collaborating with their schools thus far around the neurodiversity of your student. And this process has many nuances and layers as each school is made up of different systems and individuals such as the teachers, instructional assistants, administrators, it can go on, um, who all have their own beliefs and ways of operating. So I just want to frame that in saying that, I want to be able to frame for us this morning, I am going to be sharing neurodiversity affirming best practices for families um, to try focusing on that sphere of control even though there are other partners and players that are involved in this partnership. So that work is also taking place, but I just wanted to share that that is gonna be the focus of our time together this morning. So one last little bit before we get kicked off, I'm gonna offer these as our webinar working agreements this morning. I'd like for you to pick one that you would personally like to focus on as we engage in this work together. There's a, a quote by Dr. Crenshaw that says, if you make something unspeakable, you can't do anything about it. And so with that in mind, how can we challenge our assumptions and share openly and respect other perspectives and opinions and invest fully in the learning while also speaking from experience? Because until we make this a part of our daily conversation, that is when we're really gonna start to see that transformational change. So, oh, thank you for putting that in chat. Um, we're gonna do a little game to get started. And so if you can make sure that you have your chat available, we're gonna play a game, what's going on here? And so I'm going to share a bit of a picture and I'd like for you to just take your best guess in the chat. What do you think is going on here from what I am showing you? So let's, let's get started and play. So based off of what you can observe, what do you think might be going on in this scenario? Construction site, yeah. It, yep, I'm dangerous. Rocky Cliff, ooh, interesting. Very creative. Road closure. Sure. Kids in front of sign. Warning, stay away. Care should be taken in some way. Absolutely. Okay, great. We're on, a, we're on a good start. I'm gonna show you a little bit more. Now, what do we think might be going on? Be carefree. Teresa, that is, that is very interesting. That is a good observation. Bus, maybe? TV show? Bus, diner. Uh, <laughs> Wendy, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah, I love Lucy assembly line. Um, bus. Okay, we're gonna keep going. A ball game. Some people care about when X is in mom mode. <laughs> yes, we have a little bit more clues now.
when you got it, I tried really hard to pretend like that maybe wasn't it. The ER maybe, absolutely. So as we start to get more and more of the details that make up this image, maybe a diner, yep, and belt is in motion, we can start to see what is unfolding here. Definitely, I don't know if you can see. Yes. And so I'm gonna, just because I can't leave you hanging, let's take a look at what is actually going on here. Fine, you're doing splendidly. Speed it up a little! <laughs> So the purpose of, of this, this game was to show or just reiterate the fact that when we don't have an understanding of the full picture, we can often make incorrect assumptions about what is taking place due to our own experience and thinking. We went from, and with good intention, we went from a construction site, a rocky cliff, maybe a road closure, seeing maybe a diner, a bus, an emergency room. And then as we were getting more and more of the critical information that we needed, we then could put those all of those clues together to understand the bigger picture. And really what was taking place were two women trying to fake it as chocolatiers to make money. Um, and additionally, since we're talking about collaboration um, and establishing partnerships, what a better example than Lucy and Ethel and how they work together and they bring their unique selves and their own brilliance to the relationship. So speaking of brilliance, let's ground ourselves with a common understanding of neurodiversity and some of the terminology that we can use in our communications. So I'm going to start us off with a definition of diversity. This is from the dictionary. And what I want you to take from this is the state of variety, the variety of. And that relates to all of the different social constructs of identity, whether they are ethnicity, uh, race, gender, sexual orientation. They are a range of social constructs of identity that all shape human individuality. And there is no one right or correct identity or way of uh, categorizing oneself. There's no one correct or right identity. And so let's, let's see what this looks like visually. Here we have a visual representation of all of those different social constructs of identity. And you'll notice that those, the gray arrows are, are double-ended arrows. I guess we would call that a line, array. I don't know. Um, but that's, that's very intentional because these identities are fluid and they change over time depending on our experiences. It's an ever evolving process. And so an individual, if I were to look at um, this person here, they have an avowed identity. How do they identify themselves in all of these different constructs of identity? And there's ascribed identities. Me looking at this individual based off of my perceptions and experiences, how do I identify this person and perceive them to be within all of these different identities. We also have to consider what is the place in which an individual is operating. Different contexts may, um, may cause an individual to identify or operate in, in different ways. 
Um, so I just wanted to throw that in as a layer of this identity process. So another one of the major ways that we are defined, just like within our identities, is how our different identities and experiences shape us through our brain wiring. And so we're going to do a little bit of brain learning light. And I mean light because our brain is a far from simple structure. Many of you may have um, expertise in this area. And this is a general introduction that I'm going to go over some concepts so you have some contextual knowledge as we continue to build our understanding of neurodiversity. So here we have a neuron, a very obviously clip art representation of a neuron. And neurons are the fundamental or core units of our brain and our nervous systems. They're responsible for receiving sensory input from the external world, sending motor commands to our muscles, transform, um, transferring and relaying information such as learning, observing, and memory. So for example, when I, uh, I'm moving my arm to pick up my coffee, I go in to take a sip of coffee, um, I can feel that it's hot before it even touches my lips, um, which makes me think I can't believe that this Yeti has kept this coffee hot for so long. That process from my arm to my head was, or my thinking, all related to our neurons. And we have, as a adults, anywhere between 80 to 100 billion neurons. So they have to create some forms of connectivity. And so if we think of these means of connections or neural pathways as interstates or highways of the brain, um, these are how our experiences become our blueprints or our roadmaps for wiring. So we all have different experiences that in, are influenced by our identities and our environments and our genetics. And so here's something really cool about our neurons. Um, when we learn a new skill, when we are engaged in that productive struggle, we are, um, we are practicing through multimodal experiences, meaning multiple senses we can create new connections. So if you look at these neurons here, you'll see that when engaged in a new skill, we have the ability to make new connections. This is growth mindset. This is, maybe you've heard the term neuroplasticity. Plastic meaning you can mold it and shape it. So our brains are pretty amazing. And why this is important is that the more that we practice that skill, the more that that new connection strengthens and we can do tasks with automaticity. So if we're keeping with our roadmap um, analogy, when I practice and when I engage in a new skill with multiple opportunities for practice, multimodal instruction, I can create these new connections um, for a new skill. And the more and more I practice it, it's gonna move from being a shabby dirt road to a very thick, concrete off-ramp on the highway, because then I can do things without even thinking of it. Um, so you might've heard the term, those that wire together, or excuse me, those that fire together, wire together. This is where it comes from. And you'll see the importance of activating prior knowledge. I had to build off of an existing network. Um, so thinking of incorporating our culturally responsive pedagogy and our trauma-informed instruction, this is how it all comes together. One of the ways it all comes together of importance. We also see that if um, the term use it or lose it, our brains are expending so much energy and responsible for so many functions at any given moment. And if you're not using that new pathway, if you watch, your brain is gonna clip it right off. And why is this important? It's because if we do not engage and build on that skill, it's never going to be established. And so how does this, um, what's an example of this? So I'll give you two examples. Um, in the classroom, giving new vocabulary. I presented vocabulary terms 
We went over it. And the next day, there it was as if I never presented the vocabulary words or their meanings. And I used to get incredibly frustrated. We've done this. We've been exposed to it. We read over it. I can't believe they don't. My students cannot remember these terminologies. Well, what I did not do was I never established new connections for them and new means of understanding. I never gave repeated opportunities for engagement. I never employed multimodal instruction. I never utilized interests. And so those pathways were never created. Same thing at home. My mom used to give me um, tasks, things to do. And I'll explain this more in a little bit with some examples, but my executive functioning skills were not strongly established. And my mom would say, write a list because in her mind, it was so simple. And that's how she, that's what she could do. Um, but I didn't, I couldn't make the connection to actually applying it. And so for so long, the narrative in my head was, I can't do this. And we talk about it now realizing what if we had practice together? What if we had applied it to certain scenarios? Um, what if I had engaged in those multiple, in the multi multimodal opportunities and repeated practice? Would I have established that connection? Likely. So using, now that we have these networks or these highway systems of neural pathways, what travels along them? We can think of these electrical signals or electrical impulses, means of transferring in uh, communication as electric cars. So they travel through these networks or these highways transferring information. And we also have neurochemical signals. We can think of these like ferries, like um, boats moving from port to port, carrying information as well. You may have heard some names of these neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, but these are just a couple ways in which our brain transfers information and communicates. So let's put this all together with this definition of cognition. So cognition is that mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding it through our senses or our thoughts, whatever that might be which is what we really just broke down with that with the brain um, operation. I want us to use the prefix neuro as a synonym for cognition. So neuro here referring to cognition. And to see this visually in terms of different cognitive processes, this can refer to attention, learning, perception, thought, these are all examples of cognition, which we're now using the prefix neuro for. So when we put this all together, on the one hand, we had diversity, the variety of, and now on the other hand, we have neuro, meaning that, um, that thinking, that cognition, that processing. So when we put them together, we have neurodiversity, which is the diversity or infinite variation of human minds and how they operate and function neurocognitively. So neurodiversity is a biological fact and it is a perspective. It is the belief that there is no universal normal or right style or right way of neurocognitive functioning. So just like there was no run, one right or correct identity as a cultural construct, this is removing the value-laden system of operating to say that there is no one right way of thinking. It's a universally normal term, excuse me, universally neutral term. Um, so everyone's thinking is as unique as their thumbprint. And the diversity of thought is necessary for sustaining um, our environment. It's the diversity of minds. And neurodiversity has always existed since the beginning of our species. It has always existed. It is just now that we have the language to communicate about the different ways of thinking and the strengths and abilities that each person has. So you'll see Judy or the name Singer referenced several times 
Um, she is an autistic social scientist, um, originally from Australia, who coined this term because she was looking for a way to talk about the various ways of operating. Simple as that. So let's see this visually. Neurodiversity here, we see that each individual brings with them their own identities and their own experiences. And they have their own unique way of thinking that has been shaped by those experiences, identities, and just by how they're genetically and naturally wired. So a different way to think about this is if you have seen the movie Pixar, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. If you've seen the Pixar movie Inside Out, um, they do a really nice job of giving us an inside look of what is going on inside their brain. I think about that often now when I interact with somebody, I, the joy voice, what is going on inside their brain? So we see here in the background, they have um, a, a like a command center. It is how they're command center is structurally created. And then you'll also see those little colorful circles, which are all of the memories and experiences. And so these three individuals, all we really need to know from this is these three individuals are in the very same situation. They're having dinner together at one table. And yet each one of these individuals are experiencing the situation very differently. And so what one individual is seeing and reacting and thinking is entirely unique from the other two individuals. Um, so it really brings us to think around any time we are interacting with another individual, neurodiversity exists. They are never going to think the same way that we do. So the brilliance and advantages of neurodiversity can only be experienced when we affirm, appreciate, and foster each individual's abilities and ways of thinking. So we just talked about on, the, on this top box here, neurodiversity, the fact that every single human being um, thinks differently from one another due to those thoughts and experiences and wiring. And within neurodiversity, we have these two subcategories. These terms, which we're going to look into, are ways that we can use to describe two different ways of operating within the neurodiversity paradigm. So we're going to look at neurotypical and neurodivergent. So neurotypical, and again, these definitions that I'm um, sharing with you there are no, um, there is not a single agreed upon definition for neurodiversity, neurotypical, neurodivergent, et cetera. So what I'm sharing with you is um, what is current in the literature and piecing together so that we can get a general understanding of the function of these terms. So neurotypical is, um, Having a have neural development um, that is considered typical. So it's a term created from the neurodiversity community to talk about um, a way of operating, a brain that develops and functions in a way that is considered to be typical or most commonly occurring. Again, it's not healthier, more correct, or more right. However, oftentimes that individual is able to behave or function in a way that falls within those dominant societal standards. And so using the term neurotypical makes it possible for us to have conversations around neurotypical privilege. It allows us to talk about members of this dominant group without reinforcing power or or any idea of, of normal, because we just unpacked that universal normal does not exist. There's not one typical brain, like there's not a brain sitting in a museum in Washington, DC, um, that is a typical brain. There are still continuums of experiences for neurotypical individuals. 
Um, however, one way to think about it is that there is typical neurological development or most commonly occurring neurological development. So what if my brain diverges from this typical cognitive functioning? Here we have neurodivergence, and this is an evolving umbrella. This is not a um, set in stone list. This neurodivergence umbrella is ever evolving, and you'll see at the bottom here I have and more. This is just an example of some neurodivergences um, that are, and we'll get into the, the definition in a minute, um, that you might have personal experience with and or have a connection with and or would like to learn more about. And so this neurodivergence umbrella is ever evolving as more and more is being understood about different ways of operating. We're trying to shatter this binary approach or this means of locking into a label to really understand this continuum of different ways of functioning. So here we have a working definition of neurodivergence or a neurodivergent individual, which is having a brain that has developed in a different way. So processing information or experiencing the world is different than that neurotypical development. And so these variations, which can be genetic, have a genetic root to them, they're natural genetic variations, and or I'll share some of the discussions around the environmental variations that may affect learning, mood, attention, and other cognitive functions. Um, divergent as the root in these words is really important because divergent means starting from a common point. And so with neurodivergent, as a human, you're still starting from a common point, but instead of your brain developing neurotypically in the typical way, your brain develops in a divergent way, which is just different. It's just a different way of developing. So how might individuals be neurodivergent? It's a very simplistic overview, um, but there can be natural genetic neurological variations and there may be environmental variations. And this is one of the discussions that's currently taking place in the field. Are environmental conditions neurodivergences? Do we know anything more about them, about how long they might last? What are their impacts? That's one of the conversations that is taking place. However, I'm gonna give you an example of all three. So within brain structure, um, as a genetic, natural variation example, I learned last year that I have ADHD. There's many reasons as to why I did not learn until last year that I had ADHD, even though I came from a family um, of privilege, connected to resources. Um, there just was no or little to no research on how does ADHD manifest in females. All of the research or Majority of the research up until at least the year 2000 was done on adolescent male students. And so our understanding of ADHD was based in that manifestation. And so with this brain structure, what they're finding is that there's two areas of the brain that are three to 5% smaller. Those areas that are in charge of our executive functioning, three to 5% smaller, which does not equate to intelligence, but is a little shift. So if we think about those big highway networks of neurons, what would a three to 5% smaller difference do? Let's take the interstate or the beltway. Imagine those are all of our neural connections. And if I moved the land that that beltway sits on and I pushed it in three to 5% um, inward, that is going to greatly impact how those electric cars, or I know we don't have boats on the Beltway, but it's going to greatly impact the means of communication, whether that's through 
the cars can't get through anymore. The cars now have a straight shot and get there too quickly. Maybe now there's not enough cars. So that's one example of how a brain structure can impact or can um, lead to neurodivergence. There's also another genetic and environmental example of mental health disorders. So mental health disorders, um, having generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, panic disorder. It's interesting, we can talk another time about the co-occurrence of ADHD and mental health disorders, but with this mental health, with these mental health disorders, the electrical signals and or the chemical signals may be impacted in that means of how I function and experience the world. And an environmental example is a, I had a traumatic brain injury. And so that impacted not only my brain structure, but also how those um, electrical and or chemical signals were able to operate. So all of those examples are ways to um, give an understanding of different ways of operating and experiencing the world. This statistic came out just last year. An estimated 15 to 20% of the world's population exhibits some form of neurodivergence. And this is a great conversation starter. Um, is this number actually low? Do, do we know enough about all the different neurodivergences that exist? Is this number high? Are we actually incorrectly understanding neurodivergences? But what this is saying is that one in five people may exhibit some form of neurodivergence. And I meant to um, share previously that an individual might have one, two, three, however many neurodivergences. So as families, what are some strategies to best partner and collaborate with the neurodiversity of your student at your school? Whether they are neurodivergent or they are neurotypical, these neurodiversity affirming practices are best practices for all students. So how can we, how can we build this bridge? Um, our focus again in our time together this morning is on this bottom arrow here, this bottom blue arrow. Um, what are some family partnership strategies knowing that the school and school system are an equal part of this partnership? Um, so I'm not going to be speaking on behalf of the Fairfax County Public Schools or practices. These are strategies from research and community spaces and our schools are engaging in this work and just wanna lay it out there, this is not an overnight fix. However, we can do this together. There's our bridge, I'm sorry. I'm gonna take, allow you to read this to yourself and I will read it aloud for anyone who benefits from auditory processing. A successful partnership between families and schools can substantially improve student success in and out of schools. And this was from a research study done in 2018. So who is this community? This is a community of experts. These are family experts. And so wanted to ground us in this quote from this author that nobody has the perspective, the sensitivity, or the ability to perceive the nuances of a child's or older person's behavior that a parent or a family member possesses. For those of you who have students yourselves, you care for students, you are the experts. And so what information might be helpful for you to share with your school in this partnership? How can you frame that information? What resources might you use? And how can you build on this, not only for in, the, in your current school year, but applying it in the future? And so these family experts can be parents, guardians, grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles, whoever it might be that makes up this family um, community of expertise. 
So let's start off with our strengths. Our public education system has been indoctrinated with a deficit-laden way of thinking or deficit-based mindsets. And it is just how our education system was built. So we have to shift our mindsets, therefore our approaches with a strength-based perspective in order to achieve these academic outcomes that we have for our students and for ourselves. So how can we not only encourage and grow these strengths to continue to, to nurture them, to continually instill confidence and joy in our students' identities. And how can we also um, use these strengths in a variety of educational areas to support different avenues for success? Um, so here's some examples of some strengths that your student might have. They're just examples. And I've split them up into three different categories. So academically, maybe your student has a great strength in verbal processing. So instead of um, writing, um, writing a response, maybe they're really strong at having a discussion and a conversation about it. And so how can that strength of verbal processing be utilized in an educational space. In emotional and or social strengths, how can um, one of these skills be nurtured or leveraged? How can um, an, a student's curiosity, if they're naturally inquisitive, how can that be leveraged in the classroom to not only um, engage and pique interest, but to also see um, that success and leverage in other areas of opportunities. And then lastly, what are some talents and strengths that students have? Is it singing? Maybe could there be an opportunity to leverage that and um, turn a new learning in the classroom into a song and perform it for the class, which may help those, let's say with auditory processing to receive that information. So how can we highlight, nurture, and leverage these strengths. Um, I have this function machine here of how can we input these strengths for a variety of outputs in our classroom or educational spaces. And we also have to ask ourselves when it comes to, excuse me, when it comes to maybe an area of challenge, we have to ask ourselves, was this ever explicitly taught was the student ever explicitly taught how to do this? And it's not actually a challenge or a, a weakness. It's just that they haven't had the opportunity to, to engage. So is exposure and access really the issue? These are the, some of the questions that we can start asking ourselves. And our, in, our students' interests. So Meredith Ayala, who is an incredible family school partner specialist, um, put this really beautifully to me. She said, what would you jump out of bed at 6 a.m. for? And I'm not a morning person. Um, so if you are a morning person, you can, you can jump back that time. What would you jump out of bed at 3 a.m. for? And ask this of your, of your student. What would they jump out of bed with no whining, no snoozing, what would they jump out of bed at 6 a.m. for? And how can we incorporate these interests into the into classrooms and or lessons? And so why this is important and uh, important to leverage is that these interests support student engagement. They also may help with the student's regulation and they also can support relationship building. And so this um, I'm going to share some of these examples. This Winnie the Pooh sticker example, a student loved Winnie the Pooh. It brought them a lot of comfort, a lot of joy. Um, and so the family brought in a box of Winnie the Pooh stickers. And so the teacher was able to incorporate it into a system where they named, they were going over the different days of the week. They associated them with different Winnie the Pooh characters um, for response reward, 
students were given a Winnie the Pooh sticker. So everyone was getting um, a heightened sense of this engagement and the student felt valued and seen and got to have a greater and uh, greater opportunity for engagement because Winnie the Pooh was involved. So other examples might be incorporating um, how might baseball teams be incorporated into a math problem or offering these interests as conversation topics with the school team to build that positive relationship with that student. There also might be with interests, um, familiar items for positive associations with school. So I have examples here of stuffed animals, a picture, a favorite game. And so how might these interests Fun fact, that is my sweet little kitty, um, P or Penelope, we call her P. Um, and so she's an interest of mine. She helps to um, re-regulate my system. She, I mean, I could talk about her all day. And if I, I have a picture of her on my desk that I can use, that's only, not only serves as a topic of conversation, um, but also it helps to kind of regulate my internal environment. Um, and if we think of it in a school context, how might these items, knowing that they're there, bring that same comfort and regulation to our students by incorporating these interests into classroom spaces? So this is what we're gonna call the human factor look fors. This is a quote from a parent who shared, the child isn't their diagnosis. You don't wanna interact with your ideas about who they are. You wanna interact with a person standing in front of you. And so looking to ask ourselves, what is the why of a human behavior? What is the root of that behavior as a means of communication? Behavior is communication. What is the root of that behavior, not the symptom? Is it seeking to re-regulate? Is it um, um, working with memory? Is it a skill development that maybe there's some, some struggle with? So a sentence stem that we can use is, when you observe blank, this means blank. How can we be detectives and understand those look fors rather than being more of a judge on that little information that we know. So we're gonna connect the why to our support look fors um, while also considering that masking may be of influence in a situation which is suppressing natural behaviors for re-regulation. Um, and how does being perceived to, being do to doing well come into play? and some of these coping strategies. And so I wanted to share, I read um, an example that I wanted to share with you all. It's from the book, Uniquely Human. Um, and this is an example of a student, Elijah. Elijah is a passionate fan of Broadway musicals, in particular, The Lion King. So I want us to be aware of these human factor look fors. When he felt overwhelmed and anxious about the more challenging academic work his anxiety increased. He would stand up in the middle of his class and start singing the circle of life at the top of his lungs, first in English and then in German, his second language. The teachers at his school wanted to honor this creative spirit, but felt that it could be disruptive. So he was asked, why does he sing in class? His explanation, the teacher talks too quickly and I can't keep up. I have a difficult time paying attention, and this by singing my favorite song, Circle of Life, is my way of emotionally coping and decreasing my anxiety. Um, this song could also be looked at as another form of echoing or scripting, and so really he wasn't being bizarre or displaying random behavior. He was coping the same way another person might play a favorite tune in, in your head when feeling bored or stressed but without projecting it publicly. And so thinking of that, with that individual example, I also want to acknowledge that this was Elijah's example. No two individuals, no two neurodivergent individuals 
are the same. So in the case of Elijah, that was Elijah's case. No two individuals are the same, not only because of the experiences that they bring, but also due to that genetic wiring. And so to give you an example here, if I were to use an example of an actual neurodivergence, we here we use ADHD. One individual's manifestation of ADHD is likely or manifests likely in a very different way from another person with ADHD. And ADHD is, is actually a misnomer. It's not the inability to pay attention. It's the challenge to regulate. And that often comes with regulating attention, regulating emotion. And so paying attention is actually a superpower. Paying attention to one area of interest or many things at once, it's that challenge with regulation. And then we also have the layer of um, impact on females versus males. But what I'm really trying to get here with the example of Elijah and with the example and with this visual that no two individuals, um, whether they are neurodivergences or their neurodiversity, they don't manifest in the same way. So what one individual needs, the other might not. So let's give an example of frequent breaks. If that is an accommodation that a student might have, whether it's written in an IEP or a 504, and or it's maybe what the student needs um, in order to access their education. How can this be applied um, to students in this in this uh, frequent breaks example? Oh no! Sorry about that. Um, so before I go through this tool, I want to give how those examples all come together in the way in which each one of those students is wondrously wired. They're wired differently. And so what is the purpose of, or the function of a support? So for example, I once um, had a student, we're gonna call him Nicholas, who sometimes would shake his head vigorous, vigorously back and forth during class with purse lips. So it would look like this. And from my own lens and perspective, I interpreted this behavior as defiant, refusal, disrespect. So I would call on him to participate. Again, I'm sharing how much I've learned and I would like to, I'm sharing examples that I am not proud of, um, but to just also share kind of this evolution of learning. And when we know better, we do better. Um, and so when I would call on him to participate, he would escalate and that would send him completely out of regulation, um, sometimes breaking um, pencils or shouting. And in reality, this was this student's way of attempting to regulate his system, his, his emotions. He was trying to shake it out of his system. So instead of making personal projections or interpretations of what I perceive somebody else to be experiencing, what I needed to ask is this tool. What might Nicholas be experiencing? What is he communicating? How is my response grounded in Nicholas's support? So we see on this tool here, these self-reflective, self-reflection questions are questions that we can ask ourselves to address our own mindsets when we're encountering another individual. What might they be experiencing? What are they communicating? How is my response grounded in their support? And this can be used in the home. This can be used in the classroom. This can also be used um, with peers. Because when we move into coaching questions, these are the same questions just reframed as non-judgmental questions to promote thinking. What might so for this example, what might Nichols be experiencing? What is he communicating? How is my response grounded in Nichols's support? Because after talking with Nicholas and his parents, he shared about this regulation need and what would be most helpful to him when I observe that face shaking in those lips is to verbally say to him or to speak to him and say, let's take a minute, Nicholas. And that was his cue to know that I was there with him 
he could take a break and focus on his internal needs and that we would re regroup. Um, a different version of that same need with frequent break, it might serve a variety of functions depending on the student and their need and their manifestations to access their environment. So for example, another student of mine had generalized anxiety disorder and needed an accommodation of frequent breaks. However, with this student speaking or giving a verbal prompt of take a minute, like with Nicholas, was, was not supportive of her needs to re-regulate. For her break, this student needed to take her kitty cat hat, which actually looked like um, it was uh, knitted, so it actually looked like a stuffed animal. She needed for her break to take that kitty cat hat to the water fountain in the hallway. Why? Because this kitty cat hat was a tangible reminder of safety. And by taking a break outside of the classroom environment, that enabled her to process her anxiety before she was able to re-enter the classroom. And so this, um, this tool could be used in a variety of ways not only to understand these look-fors that we're seeing, to understand what is being communicated in this situation, um, but also could be used to develop the mindsets and approaches and language and actions of others to be neurodiversity affirming in their support. Um, and like I said, this could even be used if um, with students to be um, understanding of students in their own classrooms and ground their response in their peers' support. Another um, strategy that we're gonna talk about or what, uh, or strategy that you can, use as a, um, you can use as a family is how to pass the baton. So how can we share information about what works well, either in the home or the home environment, wherever that might be, and what might work well in the classroom um, or what worked well in the previous grade, what worked well in second grade that we wanna bring into third grade. This um, oftentimes lack of communication is not any individual's fault. There are a lack of systems that need to be in place to support this exchange of communication. It's not an automatic thought, speaking from the school when I was, um, speaking from my school experience, it's not an automatic thought. And with the day-to-day -day stress, not always on the top of your mind as the end of year approaching. So it's also this idea that somebody else is taking care of it. But there are no systems, I don't wanna speak so de uh, definitively. There are likely not systems in place to share and pass along this information, whether it's from teacher to teacher, from year to year, or transitioning from educational levels, so from elementary to middle school. And so how can we, quote, pass the baton? How can we pass this information that's in the best interest of our student? Other than sharing um, some of these examples, I also found in the literature how important it might be to connect with a current middle school student, for example, transitioning from elementary to middle school, connect with a current middle school student or staff for that processing, asking questions, um, going through a day-to-day, -day, what might that look like? Because we all know that that environment from middle school to elementary school is very different. So how can we put all this information together? This is a tool that you can use for communicating all of that powerful information about your student that we just reviewed. Um, strengths, interests, and look fors. And these can be bullet points, they can be sentences, they can be drawings, um, and they really serve as a powerful conversation starter with your student. To do this together, um, how can you affirm their interests and their strengths? And so with these look fors, the support look fors are really going back to that idea of what are they communicating? What might need to be some visual look fors for the teacher or any support staff to be aware of and better understand how their responses can be grounded in student support? So when noticing this, going back to that sentence frame, when um, if you notice or observe this, it means this. 
And so that's an attempt to hopefully, um, to hopefully interrupt um, our natural way of thinking, which is from our own perspectives, to support the student experience and the supports that they need in that moment and to not misinterpret how their needs are manifesting, to not incorrectly interpret, for example, my, be, my example with Nicholas, to not interpret his behavior as defiance or disrespect or aggression, when really it was his way of um, re-regulating his system. And it was actually a visual cue for me to support and help. Um, there's also many books that you uh, might be interested in sharing with your students' classrooms um, to share experiences, the, the experience and the voice of the student and families is always, of course, most important. And if you would like to share a, um, a story of another to help illustrate kind of the same understanding and belonging, I have a list of recommended um, books. There are some are picture books. They're all elementary um, geared. However, some you see might span up to seventh grade, but these will all be available in your session guide. How might you partner with your school librarian to share some of these titles to see if they already have them in place or if they're able to get them? And um, these conversations have also been taking place with um, the library information systems department. Their coordinator, Priscilla, is an incredible partner in this work. Um, and so we had a webinar, uh, very similar discussions about how to support and be neurodiversity affirming in their own spheres of influences like the library. And so what are some more strategies for how we can reinforce and support school at home and partner in this work? Um, Dr. Karen Knapp is a specialist in family school partnerships, and she created the dual capacity framework for school um, and family partnerships. What, what are some strategies or what are some ways in which both of these groups can come together in the best interest of the students? And one of the ways in which um, some, some of the strategies she recommended to help students with familiarity, if that is a need, to help students with um, structure, to help students if they crave predictability, what that might be. She suggested having pictures of those school environments, taking a picture of the school bus or a classroom or a cafeteria that you can have at home to process through with your student, whether they're scenarios um, or to process something that happened that day um, to, better under, to better meet the processing needs of your student. And you walk through a building tour with your student to familiarize with the environment, meet some individuals, actually recommend not trying to always go on the day that everybody goes, um, if that is a sensory overwhelm, wondering if you might be able to schedule some other times. How can you use graphic organizers um, and visuals like this schedule over here on the right to practice scheduling? Can you take this schedule that is used in a classroom and can you utilize it in your home to help reinforce when we see this? This is a transition that takes place and really in, uh, reinforcing those processes how can we use explicit instruction around executive functioning skills at home to reinforce what's being done at school? Um, having multimodal opportunities. The rule of three example is um, if, you, if you say it, write it down, and then interact either through a conversation or having the student ask questions or apply it to a scenario, um, and making that real world connection and application to create systems and routines. So an example going back to um, a personal example, I really struggled with executive functioning as a kid, um, not knowing I had ADHD. 
and used to get in so many fights with my mother. We can laugh about it now. Um, but for example, with uh, when she would ask me to do tasks, I would often be sitting maybe in front of the TV where I was getting a really nice hit of dopamine that was helping to regulate my system. It made me feel good. And I was never actually processing what she was asking me to do. So by the third time she asked me, I swore it was the first time, which only caused more fights. However, I say all that to me to mean that what we could have done in that situation, because her response was just write it down, write a list. But until I actually practiced with writing the list, applying it to the home, maybe it is um, uh, practice with organizing or prioritizing, that is when that repeated practice becomes strengthened as a new connection and a new skill to do with automaticity, like that brain connection we were talking about earlier. So could I help create a dinner schedule? Could I make or categorize um, a grocery shopping list, grouping similar items, either by myself or with her? Um, could could I, could she help me with my forward thinking and planning? Here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna go to the grocery store, make a return at Costco and go to the park. Let's talk through and process what do we need in that forward planning? What do we need to bring with us? So ways in which that those systems and um, new connections can be made, can be made at home to reinforce at school. And lastly, strategies for communicating with teachers and staff. So this is where it gets really nuanced and I do not have um, a simple answer for you in this, which I know might be frustrating. However, this two-way communication system exists between two human beings or two groups of human beings. And so what is that what is that teacher or that staff or that school's experiences? What are their beliefs? What are their approaches? Um, that's why I can't necessarily recommend or say, here is a strategy that you can use because it is so incredibly nuanced and dependent on that partnership that you have with your school. However, we can make these uh, thinking of it as a banking system, we can make these positive deposits and being proactive in reaching out with some of these tools, like the look force tool or the neurodiversity mindset, flip the script tool and make these deposits and share the strengths and interests and know um, this is what is uh, important for you to know about the strengths of my student and how they might be successful. And here are some topics that are really important for me to know about what is taking place with the student in the classroom. Um, so how can we be proactive about that? And maybe utilize some tools. I, I think I need to share this, uh, this information from Dr. Mapp, which I it was really enlightening for me. She does a bunch of, um, Dr. Karen Mapp, does a bunch of speaking engagements across the country with, with teachers. And she shared that any, no matter what phase she's in, it can be in a space of 400 educators. And she asks um, for anyone who had uh, a course or explicit instruction on best ways and practices um, for family and school partnerships. And out of, let's say those 400 people, Time and time again, she says, maybe three or four people raise their hand. And I say that because this family school partnership is so oftentimes intuitive. There aren't systems that, in place that say, do this, do this, do this. Um, teachers aren't necessarily explicitly trained in this area. So these are, this is a working um effort and partnership and hopefully with these tools that you'll see um, at the end can use them as a means of what can you control and establish those relationships. Also, who else is in the building? Can we connect with counselors, instructional assistants, school psychologists, instructional coaches, 
who else might be a part of this team that we need to include? And is, are there opportunities if um, for the PTA to have a neurodiversity committee? Are there ways that you can come together as a collective community to have these conversations and work collectively to implement these neurodiversity practices and approaches and mindsets in your own schools? And so leaving us with um, kind of to really pull together these core tenets of neurodiversity, whether someone is neurodivergent or neurotypical, um, when, when we have a plant here that, that's not growing, it's supposed to be a flower, but clearly, um, clearly this flower is not growing. And so what do we do when a flower or a plant doesn't grow? We'll, we'll often hear that you fix the soil or you add water or you move it to a sunnier location or um, I've heard people say you talk to the plant, which is really interesting and I'd love to see some of the research behind that. Um, but we never question and the flower that the flower doesn't know how to grow. We never cut up the flower. We never try to change it into something that it's not. And so when a flower doesn't bloom, we fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. And so my charge in this role to Fairfax County Public Schools and my work here is, what if we treated our, our students with this same premise, that we fix the systems in order, in the environment, in order for these students to flourish and grow into the flower that they are, whatever flower that they are, not the flower that we want, might want them to be. But how can we treat our students as that? How can we treat them as a flower, nurture and adapt their environment to meet their needs and their strengths um, so that they can flourish and have um, the equitable outcomes that they deserve? And so you will be receiving the session guide after today's session that includes not only the working definitions that we used, but the tools, the um, flip the script neurodiversity mindset tool, as well as the strengths, interests, and look for's document that you can use in a partnership with your student to therefore then share it with your school, um, whether that's the current grade or how can you use that document to share it with next year's uh, school support team and continue to grow and build on your student strengths and grounding their supports in your students' look fors. Um, and so I just, I thank you so much for your time. I have not been able to look at the chat since I love Lucy. So I will try to skim through that. And I know Mary Beth is going to um, take it from here and, and we'll do a little Q&A. So thank you all for your participation and your um, engagement. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, we do have a, some questions in the chat. I'm gonna kind of scroll back up so um, I can gather some of those for you. Um, and I do know that there was, a, and I know we had answered this the last time, but you know, families are often very curious about your role in providing professional development for teachers. Could you just kind of um, talk through that again so everyone um, understands your role and what that and what that might look like? Oh, Kristen, you're muted. Um, to give some context again, this uh, this role was created and um, started in May. And so this has not been done before. And uh, as far as we know, this is the only um, neurodiversity specialist or focused position in any public school education system in the country. And I just say that to mean that there's not something, there's not a framework that we are going off of and applying here. We are developing it and creating it based off of the experiences of families and students and, and the research. And the professional development looks like um, 
in, in my collaboration and facilitation with different central office groups, providing them with direct um, professional development and being integrated into their teams as a part of the conversation so it's integrated in the practice, as well as doing professional developments at schools for whole staffs, um, doing professional developments for our equity leads. There is an equity lead in every school. And so engaged in professional development with those individuals who can then turn and use this um, learning and language in their own contexts. So there's a um, professional development plan and there is one of me and I am working my hardest and my fastest or maybe as efficiently as I can to provide professional development to as many groups and individuals as I can um, and hopefully uh, advocating that we critically need more positions to do this if possible, um, but through the partnership with these communities as well um, is how some of the professional development is taking place. I hope that um, addressed that question. No, Kristen, thank you. And I, and I do want to put a plug in, um, and, you know, for the Parent Resource Center, you know, we do collaborate very, very much so with Kristen and um, office. And um, certainly would just like to remind everyone here that, um, you know, we can, we do confidential consultations with families. And if you'd like to come in and, and or we also meet via phone, via video chat, um, to have some conversations about maybe some resources that you might need for your child, um, or even just how to partner with your school. Um, you know, it is something that we do as part of the office that we're in, which is family and school partnerships. And so, um, you know, would love to continue to collaborate, we collaborate with Kristen, collaborate with families. Um, so please do let us know how we might be able to support you as well. Um, Thank you for making that plug because sometimes I feel like I am a part of the PRC <laughs> and that it's yeah, just right. that connection is already <laughs> made. But I'm thank you for explicitly naming you as an amazing resource. No. And I do want to share with our group that, you know, um, family and school partnerships, our office um, does provide professional development to teachers around family engagement. And so we run academy classes as such. And so do want you do want to kind of put that out to everyone that um, our goal always is to be providing as much professional development for, for school staff and um, and family engagement is 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 very important. And we want to uh, be again to continue the collaboration with families and schools. Um, so um, while we, we know that maybe it's not moving as fast as we would like, um, we really do want to make sure that everyone does know that these partnerships are it, do exist and um, we are working to support each other. I know there were a lot of questions about ADHD um, in the chat, mm -hmm. Kristen, and um, I, I do want to put a plug in um, for the resources here at the PRC. We have a lot of resources on ADHD. Um, I did also mention in the chat for, for some people who may not have seen it, um, Dr. Patricia Quinn um, does has amazing research and materials available, um, especially um, in the gender differences between boys and girls in ADHD. And we do have her books here as well as, um, I did put in the chat, um, the workshop uh, that we recorded here that she did on gender differences. So mm -hmm. um, with ADHD, so please do check that out. Um, but let's see, um, with regard to, there was a lot of great comments, Kristen, a lot of people are very appreciative of this work that you're doing and the information that you uh, were giving everyone today. Um, and, you know, a, a parent did describe kind of, you know, students being in large classes and mm -hmm. communication mm -hmm. and, you know, how, how maybe schools and families can communicate kind of um, what's happening with their child in the classroom. Do you have any maybe suggestions or strategies that a family might be able to suggest to their child's teacher with mm. regard to kind of communication, maybe 
daily or weekly communication that might be beneficial for both sides? I love that question. And I've been thinking about this a lot too. Um, I think that it's, I mean, it, as we know, it all stems from the relationship and the conversation and wondering if providing some options of what might work um, not only for you, but also in conjunction with that teacher. So for example, um, putting a, a physical note in, in your student's backpack, whether that's from you in the morning to communicate something uh, like wouldn't eat breakfast, which you know might cause that student to go into dysregulation and or vice versa if something happened or the not, um, that sounds negative. If there was a, something that the teacher wants to communicate home, could they put in a physical note in a specific folder into the backpack that you could check? Is it email? Is it phone call? Is it a text? Um, while respecting each other's boundaries, what are some options that you can provide? And being realistic about, hey, I know that every day with however many students you have in your class, the day-to-day -day stressors and all that you have to, uh, that you're responsible for even outside of the class, what is a realistic means of communication for us that we can be at the forefront and proactive and have a healthy communication system. So I would offer those kind of three um, possibilities so that it works for both, both parties and, and to get to know what systems work. Yeah, Christian, thank you. Because you, as you've said, this is really a partnership and, um, and communicating with the school, um, perhaps your family's needs, um, your child's needs is, again, just opening those lines of communication is really the first step in building that partnership. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Um, so a, 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 a family member here has said, I would like to see my elementary son in an ADHD dedicated class via mm -hmm. special, you know, spread as, as opposed to being spread out through all classes. I know this may put a label on the students, but that's happening anyway as the bad kid in class that takes a lot of their teacher time. It seems having an expert teacher in class that for success would help. Can you change my mind on why it's a bad idea? That's a great question. That's such a good question. I have lots of thoughts on um, the, especially around ADHD, but also those uh, mis gross misjudgments on bad kid or bad behavior. I think it really is, and again, this is not going to be help, uh, comforting because it's not a quick fix, but we have been, um, we have been told a specific narrative for a very long time about, especially in our area, what is, quote, acceptable behavior, what is, quote, normal behavior, and that does not, um, outside of some of those societal expectations, that there, there is no universal normal. So when we, how do we better understand that let's say, because oftentimes in ADHD in boys, it's the high, we see a lot of more physical movement versus in females, uh, instead of the running of the body, it's the running of the brain, uh, kind of that continuous thinking. Um, and so how do we, it's gonna take work, but I think to shatter those biases and stereotypes and miss just the misinformation that has existed around ADHD, especially. Um, and it's not that your student can't do something, it's that their environment is not supportive and conducive of how they best operate. And so I think until we start employing UDL in our classrooms, which is the Universal Design for Learning, and that we understand the manifestations of behavior that are not right, wrong, bad, um, that we understand what is being communicated and what does that student need to access education and be successful. So there's a, I have a, there's a lot of amazing points in your question. Who is that? Um, I'll find it, but um, I think we'll get there. I really do, which I know is not comforting <laughs> to your, your current student's classroom. However, it's just we have to shatter 
these biases and stereotypes and misunderstandings around these different ways of operating. Oh, Kristen, thank you. Um, did you want to share, you put up on the screen here, this I'm determined one pager. Is there something that oh, you wanted to address? Sorry, I I forgot that I was sharing my screen. No, um, that's okay. I think someone had shared it because mm -hmm. when I was showing, um, it must've been when I was showing this example of a tool, um, sorry to give you guys like slide whiplash, but um, this wow. tool of how can they, use this not only for current classrooms, but for tr quote, transferring that baton. Um, someone was sharing an example of, of what they use, but I do like how this support look for us. Um, I don't think that mm -hmm. this one pager, I guess it might be under my needs, mm -hmm. um, but I really like addressing those support look for us so that we, yeah. to that previous question that we don't misinterpret behaviors or needs that are rooted in our own perceptions. No, absolutely. And, and I really, I, I agree and, and encourage our families to share this information with, with teachers, even if as you're progressing through elementary school, even if you're not transitioning, say from elementary to middle, but it, it's very beneficial there as well, but even from year to year. Um, and it's, I, I would encourage, you know, families to, you know, talk with the school administration and have this conversation about how might we be able to share this information um, about my child with their teacher for next year? How could we maybe have a system in place? And I think when, when more families ask school administration for things like this, it starts to become something that may, um, may happen. And, you know, again, it's, it's letting your needs know known um, in the school and, and what your child may need. Um, I remember, and my daughter is in graduate school now, but when she was in elementary school, her principal actually invited families to kind of do a survey about their child at the end of every year mm. to see who might, what teachers might be a good fit the following year. Mm. And I found it so amazing, and I'm not sure if it was happening a, a lot, but it was, I was really able to spend time and then talk about my daughter and talk about what her needs were and what her interests were. So I, I definitely, um, you know, if that's not happening in your school, please do talk with your school administration. Um, it would be certainly beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, I love that you, um, that is a beautiful example of that partnership. And I know that it's probably frustrating for families to, to hear, to feel like the ownership is on them. And the, our hope is that, or not our hope, the ownership is not solely on families. The ownership is right. also on the school system. Yes. And we are, the school system and families are learning this almost in tandem at the same time. So yes, of course, we would hope that the school system is already providing these supports or these mindsets. And they are learning as well. And that is my job. And so um, that's kind of, I'm hoping to give that as also some context and hopefully alleviate some of the frustration that might currently exist. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I think we are out of time and we really appreciate um, everyone joining us today. Um, and again, please do uh, reach out to us at the Parent Resource Center. Um, we would really be happy to, to be a thought partner with families around your concerns and how you might then be able to partner with your school on some of the ideas that you all have brought up today. Um, and so want to, to thank everyone again. Thank you, Kristen, for the wonderful information. And we really um, look forward to our next uh, round, which is around middle schools. And that is going to be um, in March. So we're super excited for that. All right. Thanks, everyone. And hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thank you.